couple weeks, so this week and next week, we're focusing on foundations and vocabularies because I firmly believe that you cannot talk about art and uh, theorize about art and write about art without the language, right? Without a foundation on what are the different elements of art that we can talk about, and, and their definitions, as well as clear examples for, for all of you um, uh, of those particular foundations and vocabularies. So this week we will be um, emphasizing uh, the basic grammar of any type of visual, object, artwork, anything, right? Well, how do you even begin to create something in space? Well, these are things. So today we're, we're focusing on line, form, volume, mass, and texture. And the episodes for this week are all going to focus on um, these sort of, of elements, but I've grouped them very purposely because uh, they all flow into each other, right? If you understand a line, uh, form, volume, mass, and texture are the logical things that come after. So everything is gonna have a flow, despite the fact that we will be moving from one definition and example to the other. And so next week we will do the same thing, but with uh, materials and processes for making art, like what is art made out of? How do you make it? What are the different categorizations for makers of, of art? And then, and that, that will be our foundations of vocabulary. So, you know, hopefully get you on a really good footing for the rest uh, of the class. So let's get started. So I always start my episodes with the objectives of that particular video. And so today you will be able to identify different types of line. You'll be able to explain how artists create shape from line and the effect that it has depending on the, the intention of the artist's line. Understand the meaning of form, describe different types of form, and identify how volume, mass, and texture influence form. So hopefully this shows you that going from line all the way to mass and texture is a very logical flow and will make sense. So let's begin with line. Line is the main, not the main, but the, the, the most basic uh, way that any particularly two-dimensional, uh, specifically two-dimensional shape uh, form is created. And um, anyone, you know, this is something that it, we all do. If we think about writing, if you, if, you know, we still, <laughs> if you still hand write uh, words, you are using line to communicate uh, ideas, right? Same thing with art. It begins with line. And there are different types of lines that do a variety of different things. It, it's a very powerful uh, tool in, uh, in, in, our, in our wheelhouse, in the artist wheelhouse. And I have uh, uh, images here today, and these images uh, for you going forward, th these are demonstrative. So I want you to keep in mind, and I'll put this in the, in the study guide, keep in mind these particular images that I have very intentionally put next to definitions, because it's important for me to not, to not only just give you a definition, but to give you a visual example, and then of course me talking about on, on why they connect. But keep that image reference in, in, in mind when thinking about all of your definitions. And so this is the one of my favorite examples of uh, prehistoric um, art from uh, South South America, and these are the Nazca lines, uh, and the, this is the hummingbird. And if, if you know anything about the Nazca lines in Peru, uh, these are uh, these monumental um, uh, artworks created just with making a line in in the dirt in the actual land. And these are, like I said, a monumental scale. You can only see the full shape from 
the sky, right? So this image right here looks like, you know, it looks small you know, because of the dimensions of the image itself on the PowerPoint, but this was, was made, this actual image was made from an aerial view from an airplane uh, or, or drone, right? So it doesn't necessarily show you the scale of it, but it, these are massive scale um, works of art that, you know, that, that you can research your, your own, they're very, uh, of, of all of the, the things scholars like to say about these things um, on your own, but they are fascinating. So what can a line do? Well, it can mark connecting points. That's you know, very, uh, that's easy to, to remember, right? Like, so A, if you have A and B, if you, you use Google Maps, you, you say plug in my location and plug in the location I want, it will make a line and it will go from A to B, right? So it, it marks, it joins two different spaces together. It also defines boundaries between planes, right? In a two-dimensional work of art, right? So here, this, this picture plane right here, right? The actual image, this is, this is, this is a plane, right? And it's a two-dimensional plane because it, we, it, it, it does not exist in space as an object, this image, right? So most paintings are, are two-dimensional. Um, you know, you could see even relief sculpture has elements of two dimensions. Um, but so what does this do? A line can say, well, this is a flat surface to our eyes. It's totally flat. Um, but my line is now going to separate this patch of, of dirt from this patch of dirt. It's dis making them distinguished from each other versus, you know, here it's all together. But if I put a line through it, we get a sense that there is division. There's two different planes now within the two-dimensional space. It can define shapes, right? So the hummingbird, right? The line could take any trajectory that it wanted, but it did in, in a way that conveys the, the message to us that this is an animal and in particular because of the detail of this, you know, their long uh, beak, you know, and the way that they're, they fly and their wings, that this is a particular type of animal. This is a hummingbird, right? So the line defines shapes. It also directs our eyes to look at something within a work of art. It, 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 there's a way that lines direct our own vision, our own eyes. So for instance, in the hummingbird, you can't help but follow the line with your eye and just really take in the boundary uh, cr created to, sh to, to give us this wonderful flying animal, right? In, in, in the way that the lines go in and out and in and out, it gives a sense of movement because we are using our eyes and going around that perimeter. Even though this hummingbird is not moving, it seems like it's moving to us just by moving along that line. And that flows into, it conveys movement and energy. Uh, so line is very, very powerful. And uh, this is a, a general sense of, of what it can do, but we can get even more detailed um, in different types of line. So the first type of line is contour. And notice I have it bolded and underlined. If you see that in an episode, it is something for you to pay attention to. It will probably be on the study guide, know how I talk about it, know its definitions, right? So that's for you to, to see in your mind of, oh yes, I need to pay attention to that. A contour line is an edge or profile of an object, but it is not necessarily the complete outline of a shape, right? Um, contour lines suggest volume and space by giving us clues about the changing characteristics of a surface. Contour lines are often actual lines. So to conceptualize this a bit beyond this definition, let's look at our example from the artist Henry Matisse um, and themes and variations. And he, he did a lot of these just very simple line um, draw, uh, drawings, a uh, crayon on paper of, of, of different people. And so this is a figure uh, of a woman who uh, it has a scarf a very wonderful voluminous scarf wrapped around her head. 
And so a contour line is basically an, a, a line that is creating that boundary, right? The fact that he's just using a simple crayon on paper, but now turning that line into something we can recognize. We can recognize a human face, uh, some hands. We recognize that there's something she's covering her head with. We see hair, we see eyes, right? And it's unbroken. Right, it is a con an actual line is an unbroken line. It's you take your pen or you take your crayon on the on the paper and you move it across it without moving and you get a solid straight unbroken line. But of course, as an artist, you can play with your actual lines. I notice how you know these the lines are these actual lines are not connected, but they are just giving a, a, that sense of 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 movement, a folding of. Of, the, of that volume and, and vol, voluminous um, fabric, right? Um, but they still are actual lines and they are doing contouring. They're giving, they're giving shape uh, to, to what we're looking at. We also, on the opposite spectrum, we have implied lines. These are not actual lines, meaning that they, the, the line that they are created, creating is, 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 an, is an illusion, right? When we think of a line, we think of this thick, straight um, thing, right? But you can imply a, a straight line without actually doing that. And, and I love this example uh, that really shows the power of, a, of, an, of uh, an implied line. Um, and this is Guame Apollinaire, and this is a calligram. Uh, maybe you have done a calligram before, maybe when you were younger. I know I have, where you write a poem, right? Say, I, I remember writing a poem about a cat, and then I was asked to use that, the, the words and create the outline of a cat with the actual poem of a cat, and that's a calligram. And so this is a calligram that he made um, for a romantic interest, right? So we have the portrait of a, a lady with a hat, right? And see, he's implying the line. He's implying a contour of a portrait of, of a person, but it is not an actual line. This is not a continuous line. It is, is just a writing just put together to, and populating the space to make it look like it is an actual line. And so they give impressions without giving a continuous mark. And so this is a really good example, hopefully, of that implied line and so we have now actual lines and implied lines, right? Both can do the work of contouring, of creating a sense of space and shape. And so we're going to do a, a little pause right here um, and do, do, do a discussion, right? So if you were given something like this, a painting, a really wonderful painting by Jean-Antoine Watteau, the, embark the Embarkment of a Cythera, it's a painting from the 1700s, um, Watteau, French painter. Um, this style of painting came about with, uh, within a period we call the Rococo uh, in, in European art history, and Western European art history, and it was very popular amongst the French uh, aristocrats, aristocrats, very wealthy people, and they really liked um, lavishness. They loved the sumptuous environments and clothing and hairstyles. They also really loved the idea of, of ancient mythology, in particular these spaces where you can just go and party and you know be romantic with all of your you know the people there. This kind of very bacchanal kind of way this, uh, that, that you see in a lot of uh, Greek mythology. And that was very popular with the, the wealthy class of the time. That's a little back background. But we do have implied lines, right? We have actual lines and we have implied lines. Can you identify any implied line, right? Remember, lines don't have to be lines. They don't have to be single things. They can be objects, how they are placed, what are they doing, right? And so hopefully you're seeing the scene in this wonderful landscape that just expands way into the distance. 
hopefully you see that, wow, okay, I, I get a sense of landscape, right? And there are actual lines, you know, that are creating um, the different contours of the this foreground, right? That this is this nice grassy knoll. It's closer to us, the implied viewer, uh, looking at this group. Um, and then we can see that it kind of just goes off into the distance and we can kind of see the mountains, but there's there's a lot of atmosphere. So what is he doing, right, with these with these figures, right? Hopefully, maybe in your mind, you're, you say to yourself, well, these figures are actually acting as an implied line, right? How they are placed, they are placed right next to each other, and it's following the contours of this uh, mythological space, this environment, this landscape. And so they are helping us as viewers of this painting to really get it hit it home for us that this there's some sort of barrier here, right? There are people on this side, there are people on this side, and this scene is expanding into the distance. And those figures are acting as that implied line. And because lines can do a lot of things, it's, it's directing our eyes and it's creating movement through space uh, and, and time as well. I mean, you could even say these wonderful little uh, cupids or puti, as they are sometimes called in art history, they are acting as a line kind of follow, making our eye follow even further in, in that distance um and so th that is the implied line so hopefully you you see that and it's 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 there right but line can also make shape right sometimes lines exist as lines but sometimes lines as they often do in an art are connecting other things and creating a shape, right? And a shape is something that is is, is only really there in two-dimensional works, right? As we'll see later on, three-dimensional works of art have form, right? So shapes are two-dimensional. And line really creates the boundaries and contours of whatever we want to see, right? Be it Pablo Picasso's Demoiselle de Avignon, this group of uh, you know nude models, and or Georgie O'Keeffe, uh, the famous New Mexico-based artist. Uh, it could be this wonderful painting of of a flower, a Jack in the Pulpit fl flower in particular. In particular. But lines can give us a, a they, they create boundaries, they make contours, but they give us a, a they can do more, right? They they can create shapes that have particular characteristics, and uh, some of those is geometric and organic shapes. Hopefully, looking at these two examples that I've put together, you see that Pablo Picasso's lines are very rigid, right? They 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 are. Um, they're not there's not a lot of curves. They, there's a lot of right angles. Um, very, very much simple, very abstract uh, shapes, geometric shapes, right? Versus George O'Keefe's Jack in the Pulpit is full of curves. It's, oh, there's, oh, there's really no straight edge or straight line anywhere in, the, in her painting. And that is a tool, right? That is a tool that artists use and can do with line, right? Am I mimicking it, right? Am I reducing something like a human body to its basic geometry with line? Or am I focusing on this very amorphous and nebulous line that's just wandering around? And we tend to, it, our eyes, see this difference in terms of geometric or organic. Lines that are more meandering seem a little organic because in nature, right, when you look at, uh, you know, say, a flower, yeah, it might have straight lines, but it, the things flow. Things are a little bit more chaotic um, and, le and less rigid and controlled. Uh, then, you know, if you're looking at an architectural building, right, that you see stones that are rectangular, you see pillars that are straight lines, right, it gives a different sense, a, a different feel, right, and so line can cre create geometric um, and organic shapes. Line can also communicate ideas, right, ideas and um, actions. And so they can be communicative, 
and the and specifically the looking at the direction of the line lines can be diagonal lines can be vertical lines can be uh horizontal lines can be, can be squiggly right they can be any anything they they want but in in art in lines actually do do give a sense of of certain actions and in concepts depending on their orientation. Specifically, vertical lines, horizontal lines, and diagonal lines all conveys, con convey things. Um, and this isn't a fast, this isn't um, a strict d definition. There are ar artworks that challenge some of the, the things that I'm gonna talk about here, but a lot of, of works of art use lines in this way. So vertical lines often are used to convey something that's very massive and sturdy, monu monumental, right? If, I mean, think about something like uh, a really tall skyscraper. That is a very t vertical line and, and it's being used and it's conveying something that is very big, right? Something that's tall, it's above you. It, it also relatedly conveys uh, ideas of strength stability and authority, right? Something that's higher than you and you have to look up, you get that sense that it's stronger than you, it's very stable, and it's definitely has more power than you. Horizontal lines are often used to convey landscape, right? So any any piece of paper that you that you have that's just blank, say it's a it's a piece of a printer paper, it's blank when you look at it, but take a marker and make a horizontal line through that entire piece of paper. And suddenly you have a landscape, you have a sky and you have ground. And so horizontal lines are often used to distinguish different planes within the environment. Where does the, the water end? Where does the land end? Where does the tree line end? Where and where does the sky begin, right? It also can convey uh, calmness, peacefulness, and passiveness, right? It's the opposite of vertical lines that seem very monumental and strong and authoritative. The horizontal lines are usually, you, you, you look at uh, the floor, right? Things are below you. You walk on it, you meander on things, you know, walking through the landscape on that line is a peaceful experience. And then diagonal lines are lines that convey movement. Something is happening in the moment. You are catching something that is on the move. Uh, it creates drama, action, and also it can disorientate. Um, shifting the, the angle of any perspective uh, takes it off of that vertical horizontal axis and can kind of make you a little dizzy, right? So when, when you get dizzy, it's usually because your, your mind is, is, is getting destabilized, too many uh, verticals. That's why people don't like shaky cam, camcorder camera footage because um, that, those, that diagonal line is really messing with your sense of orientation. And so we're going to do the same thing that we did with Watteau's um, painting. I'm going to walk us through this, another painting by uh, Thomas Eakins, uh, a bit, a bit more, a, a century, basically essentially a century, a little bit more than a century later from Watteau, but this is in uh, the U.S. So Thomas Eakins, a very famous American painter, and he really did like painting scenes of just everyday actions, just the minutia of any type of activity. So, you know, here for an example, this isn't necessarily the scene that he's created is very fleeting, just uh, two to the, the, the Bigland brothers racing um, their, their boats right on a river in, you know, in the surrounded by, by forests. This is something that you commonplace if you are around rivers during times when the crew team are doing their, their, their practicing, um, or their, or their, you know, their regattas, right. And which is what we see here. Notice we have actually two boats and we get a sense that they're racing other, uh, other crew, uh, uh teams. And so, how can we look at this and really show what this these lines are communicating? So let's start with uh, the horizontal line. So we see that that we have a landscape, right? We get a sense that we are in uh, a river. Maybe it's a pond. 
Uh, we don't know, but just knowing crew, they, they like to, did you have rivers uh, because you don't have to turn around? Um, so we get a sense of, of, of separation, water, land. We also have horizontal lines that distinguish the tree line from the sky. We also have hor horizontal lines that are acting as our boats, right? Um, and look, what calm, peace, passiveness. Um, these lines, the line of the boat is very much mimicking these smaller horizontal lines that are the, the ripples in the water. And the ripples in the water are not, they are very horizontal, which if you've been, been on a boat or just watched water in general, when, when it's just kind of very slowly, very peacefully trickling in a horizontal line, that usually means that there isn't a lot of, of, of waves, right? There's not a lot of turbulence in the water. So you get a sense that the, this boat, which is emphasizing these calm water li horizontal lines in the water, that it is a peaceful glide through the, the, the water, right? There, there isn't probably not a windy day. It's probably a calm, maybe a little bit humid summer or spring day in the sun, but it has that kind of calmness um, as they glide. The vertical lines, right? We see uh, vertical lines, and not 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 a lot in the sense of you know very apparent. I think there's a lot of a lot of horizontals here, but you could say that um, you know the trees are example of vertical lines, right? Trees, and especially in a forest, all aligned, right? You know, vertical, 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 gives a sense of you know the probably maybe the just the, the stable growth, the strength of this forest this is a very formidable formidable forest, right? That it's rooted there, it's, it's there, right? It's not going anywhere, uh, the trees aren't. And then diagonal lines, right? We have a few, we have two main diagonal lines. One of them is very apparent, the other might not be so apparent, apparent initially, but they are conveying drama, movement, action, um, now maybe not so much disorientation in this context. So hopefully you, you are looking at this image and you are saying, well, yes, the the um, the oar to uh, to the, the the crew boat is at a, a diagonal, which looks it's in striking contrast to all of the horizontals that exist. That it just cuts right um, it, at a diagonal. And so what is that showing? It's showing that we are looking at them. They're not just sitting peacefully in the water, just floating and kind of hanging out. No, the, we are mid stroke, right? It's the piece before that oar hits the water and disturbs that calmness, right? And so we get a sense that we are in the middle of it. And look, and I love this, look how the arm and the oar also create a, a diagonal triangle shape, right? So we get a sense of the power of the actual strength of the arms and um, I haven't done crew before, but I know it takes a lot of upper body strength to do. So you get a sense of the movement. So, and the movement is condensed in the center of, of the work. So we are focused on it. It stands out against the calm back background with all the, the horizontal lines. The other horizontal line, which is less apparent, but maybe you, you see is um, in the sky. Notice the clouds. Some you you can you know paint clouds however you want. Clouds come in many many uh, different sizes and forms and shapes, and but but um, but but Eakins has chose chosen to actually put them on a a diagonal, right? And so we get a sense that the these clouds are probably moving a bit fast, right? These aren't the clouds just kind of hover right um that they actually might be moving that so maybe there is a little a little wind or maybe there's a storm coming it also acts as a really wonderful foil to the calmness right so that you have a calm environment a calm water but we have this dynamic sky um, that is actually also at the same angle as that oar right so the action here is mimicked in the action of the the cloud above so very, so the lines can do a lot of things here um, and they can communicate these certain uh, ideas.